Hey everybody, welcome. This is probably one of the best interviews that I've ever gotten to do personally, and it means a lot to me. I know a lot of you guys already know about the Katie Stockelman case. Katie Stockelman was eight years old. She was abducted, and then she was later found deceased. But the things that this man that did this to her did were absolutely terrible. I want you all to stop and think. I want you to imagine that somebody had done something to an innocent child in your family, and then you end up at the same exact prison as the person who did it. What would you do? Well, Jared is going to tell the story of what he did, and a lot of you probably have already heard it from the news, from other people's content, but I'm the very first person who has gotten to sit and talk with Jared Harris about what he did for retribution for his little cousin, Katie. And personally, I think Jared's a hero for this. And I know that this is an older case, but you are going to hear facts from this case that you are not going to hear anywhere else, and it's going to be straight from the dude who was there, who did this thing. And Jared reached out to me specifically and offered to share his story with this community, which to me is a complete and total honor. So y'all already know what time it is. Let's go! What's up, my man? Thank you for being here. Oh, no problem, man. How's it going? Good, man. Good. Blessed. I have been following your story uh, for a really long time and the story of what happened to Katie, unfortunately. And there's no way that from the outside, like you can know what the media is going to tell you. We all know they paint their own picture. Uh, the police reports are going to paint a specific picture. Can you give us the inside about what happened? Uh a distant cousin of mine, you know what I'm saying, was unfortunately molested and killed. You know what I'm saying? It was a big news story, especially because some of the stuff that, like, the, the technology that the FBI used to actually catch the, the guy that did it. But uh, it was really weird because initially someone else had, like, confessed to the murders and stuff, and then they found out that it wasn't even him that did it. It was just, he was a little out of his mind. Yeah, do you remember that part? No, I did. I hadn't read anything about that part. Okay, so, yeah. <clears throat> It was a small town that it happened in, population probably 12, 1,300 people, right? So they they knew the murder, whatever else. Well, some guy, like, turned himself in, com you know what I'm saying, confessed to all the crimes and was in jail for, I don't know, a few weeks. But as they got to interviewing him, a lot of the stuff that he was saying didn't add up. And so they ended up having to release him. And then it was through, I guess, a newer technology, you know what I'm saying, and some of the DNA stuff that the FBI was able to do that they were actually able to catch who, who honestly did it. So dude just walks into the police station, admits to a, a heinous crime. Yeah. Like, the crime was heinous. You know what I'm saying? There's a child involved. And he just says, yo, it, it was me. I did this. and didn't even have the facts of the case. And they they ended up getting the right guy. He ended up stating that she was walking to the Dollar General because, I mean, this town has literally a subway, a gas station, and a Dollar General. That's, like, the only places you can go. Yes, and sir. He said, so, it, it, it being a smaller town, man, and the fact that she only lived a couple blocks away, like, the parents obviously felt comfortable with, you know what I'm saying, her walking to the store. Yeah. So, when the guy went in and turned himself in, he he, he told the police that he was they had a meth lab and that in her on her way to the store that she stumbled across them making meth. And so that he killed, he killed her to silence her. <clears throat> so he threw himself out there as a meth cook as well. Yeah. That's insane, bro. That's wild. So they, they clear him of it. Did he yeah. get any charges for like filing a, or wrongfully confessing? I, I don't believe so. I think <clears throat> they just came across the realization that he was unstable. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't all there. Yeah. And so it was just, yeah, they ended up letting him go. So then they got the right guy yeah, and they had him with DNA evidence, which yep. once they hit you with DNA, that that's conclusive. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So then he ends up going to prison and they put him in the same prison as you. Well, OK, I'd already been in prison for five years when the case happened. Right. And so yeah. by the time he went through the whole trial process, because it was a, it was a major case, I'd been in prison six years. And in Indiana, there's only three maximum security prisons. So one in three shot of him coming where I was at. Go Let ahead. me ask you this. So you're doing time in Indiana. What are you down on? Uh, a burglary. A burglary? Okay. Yeah. And they give you eight years for a burglary in Indiana? No, they gave me 20 years for a burglary in Indiana. Oh, damn. Man, it was right after my 16th birthday. Mm -hmm. I was waived to adult court. 
and I'm not justifying it. What I did by all means was wrong and I regret it. But that being said, it was a house burglary, nobody home, only property loss and damage. That was going to be my next question is, was it an occupied dwelling? Because, you know, anybody who's been in the life knows that if you're trying to just do a normal burglary, it becomes a nightmare. If somebody happens to be home that you get caught for that, it ups your time. So 20 years for just an unoccupied dwelling burglary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So one in three shot dudes coming to you. Yeah. And, and he just happens to land there. Well, yeah, because the, like the, the DOC Department of Corrections had no idea of <clears throat> knowing the connection between myself and Katie. Like mm -hmm. she was a distant cousin and my crime happened before his. So yes, there was no documentation and no reason to keep us apart. And he had no knowledge of, you know, what I'm saying her having family in the Department of Corrections. So he couldn't hip him to it and try to get it avoided uh, beforehand. How did you find out that he landed? Because I'm sure you were watching it, right? Like it was a big <laughs> yeah. case. I'm sure you were watching as the whole trial progressed and, and every time it was on the news, how'd you find out he landed at your prison? All right. So I'm out on the yard, not even supposed to be right. Cause I mean, in higher security levels, you can move around a little bit, you know, as long as you're back where you're supposed to be at count time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, man, he, there's a group of guys coming from a different cell house going to the OSB building, which is where school medical, everything is. And uh, a partner of mine was like, Hey man, I think that's him. And I look at the guy, but from all the news stories, he had a bald head, you know what I'm saying, glasses. This guy has long hair to his shoulders, you know. And uh, honestly, he was a little bit bigger than I expected because dude's like 6'4", you know. Oh, so, damn. Yeah. So I was like, all right. I was like, I don't think it's him. And so I, I, I walk up into the school building with him, and I'm like, hey, man, what's your name? And he just looks at me and tries to hit the button for the guard to release the door to let him in. And I'm like, man, what's your name? And he won't tell me. But in Indiana, everybody has to wear a state issued ID with your picture and your name. Same as Oregon. So, yeah. So I snatch his ID off it off his shirt and I look at it and I just hand it back to him and walk off because, I mean, I wasn't in a position to do anything. And even if I did at that point right there, like we'd have been caught instantly. Yeah, it was a bust, bro. Yeah. So you got him located. Then then what did you do from there? Figure out where his housing was? Well, I mean, it's, okay, so the prison I was at is has multiple sides, right? In Indiana, mm -hmm. like a one is like a worker lease, lower level, twos, fences, threes and fours are, you know what I'm saying, major fences and walls. So I was actually at a prison that had a level three side and a four side. The four side has uh, four cell houses of about 300 people each. So it was D, E, F, and G. And he, I saw him come out of D, so I knew he was in D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So- then what did you do? How'd you formulate this plan? Because this this is this is awesome. What you right, did so, here is pretty amazing. Man, all right. So obviously after the incident happened, you know what I'm saying? There was a year or so before he even popped up, man. So there was multiple visits that I had with family or whatever else, right? As yeah. far as the idea for it, man, like I can't even take credit for that. Like that's my mom and not even intentionally. So yeah. Oh, damn. So just, I mean, in the course of conversations and stuff, man, one day we were at a visit and uh, she would just offhand comment. She was like, what somebody needs to do is tattoo, you know what I'm saying? Katie's name across his forehead. That way everybody knows what a sick individual he is. You know what I'm saying? And he's just branded for life. Yeah. And that was actually the end of the conversation. At that point, I think she went up to the vending machine and got me something. And then, you know what I'm saying? We switched subjects when she came back. So that, that idea just kind of, seeded it well like i didn't even think of it at that point man so let me explain this i mean higher security level like that uh i was like i was doing 20 years but i was the baby of the group and not only in age you know what i'm saying but also in time mm -hmm. i think the next closest person that i associated with had like a 40 to 20 after that was 65 and then so on and so forth so uh man like i had had conversations with my mom and i was i mean without trying to so i was like man look he comes here i'm gonna kill him you know and my mom was like, no, the family doesn't want that. Like, they really don't. He's got life without parole, you know what I'm saying, plus 30 years. That's the easy way out. If he has a rough time the whole time, they're fine. But don't give him that out. Yeah. And uh, at first, I thought, man, maybe that was just like them trying to save me. Like, hey, don't catch another 40 or 50 years over a prison murder and ruin your life, right? So uh, it just so happens that after I told you, like, he did pop up and the family did find out he was there, man. Uh, I had a buddy that was in D cell house with him. His name was uh, Fisher. They call him Ghost. He was uh, he was doing 176 years. 
And a uh, ghost instantly got at me. He was like, bro, he was like, you say the word. He was like, I'll go in there. I won't come out till he's dead. And I'm like, all right. So I remember going to the next visit with my mom and it was on a Sunday. She came and saw me every other weekend. You get visits every two weeks. And uh, I tell her, I'm like, look, mom, you don't want me to get in trouble, whatever. Like, but uh, if you guys want this done, it can get done. And I promise there's no blowback on me whatsoever. And she was like, no, Jared, like what we said is legit. You know what I'm saying? If you, you guys want to give him a rough ride, have at it, but, but don't give him that free out. And so, I mean, at that point, cool you know what i'm saying i'm i knew something was gonna happen eventually because i'd run into him but i didn't know what and it was maybe a uh, two two months might have been like two months after that one day i'm sitting in the cell house i'm in and they're like hey pack up you're going to d and i'm like what they're like you're going to d i'm like okay so they put me a, like there was one cell in between me and this guy Ooh. yeah so basically they they just set up the whole play do you yeah. think the prison administration knew or do you think this was I, just a complete oversight? Complete oversight, because especially with everything that happened afterwards. So you got to D. How long did you wait? I mean, he's a cell over. How long did you wait till you you handled it? All right. So I got there on Wednesday, man. And uh, men like when I got there, like a buddy of mine named Wood was a black dude. He pulls up on me. He was like, hey, because they call me check in the joint. Right. Mm -hmm. So he was like, check. He was like, man, look. I, this dude's been paying me, but I understand the circumstances. He was like, so it's on you. Do what you want to do. You know, he's like, yeah. I ain't tripping about the money. So I'm like, all right, cool. So uh, I believe that night, man, I grabbed, you know what I'm saying? The paperwork that I had, man. And uh, I went into his cell and uh, I made him read it to me. You know what I'm saying? We, we had a We had a nice, long, in-depth talk. You know what I'm saying? Dude was in tears afterwards. I mean, fake tears. But you know what I'm saying? At that point, he's just trying to save himself. Tears that he so, got caught, not tears for yeah, what he did. Without a doubt. And so, like, at that point, I still didn't know what I was going to do. So I went back to Woods. I was like, bro, I'm not going to fuck up your money. I was like, I'm going to do something to him. But in the meantime, keep getting what you're, you know what I'm saying, you're getting. He was like, all right, cool. I was only in that cell house for a day and a half. And Friday morning, I get called to the counselor's office. And I signed some paperwork that they're going to transfer me from the level four side to the level three side. So I, I, they're to move me away from him, I probably never would have saw him again. It's like 9 a.m. that morning. The counselor tells me, hey, have your stuff ready to go because at 2.30 count, you're moving. Yeah. Yeah. And so at that point, I'm like, all right, there's no way I'm leaving this cell house and not doing something. <laughs> you already know. <laughs> yeah. So I went back to my cell and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm going to hype myself up, but I'm trying to figure out exactly what I'm going to do. And then that's when that conversation with my mom from the visit previously, you know what I'm saying? At that point, it might have been six months prior about the tattoo. Yeah. I'm like, all right, yeah, this is what we're doing. <laughs> Excellent. So, hey, do you want to do you want to run me through? Because, like, you know, the news can speculate, and police reports can speculate. The DRs can speculate. You know, discon misconduct reports or disciplinary reports can speculate. But, and and you know, I can speculate because I've gone into people's cells and done some wild shit to them but yeah like, do you want to run us down what happened when you actually went in that cell all right so in, in the higher security levels man you don't come out a lot like you come out for breakfast you come out for lunch you come out for dinner you might come out for like an hour wreck out in the yard and then maybe an hour or two in the day room so i knew lunchtime was the only time i was going to have out with him between you know what i'm saying that and the 2 30 count when i was scheduled to leave so at lunchtime i come out real quick and I'm like, hey, man, I need to holler at you in your room, man. Hurry up and eat. So he was like, all right, cool. Well, I just go wait in his room for him. He comes in. And when he does, that's the only thing about the story that wasn't great. I didn't lock the door. You know what I'm saying? I pull it shut, but I put myself in between him and the door. So yeah. he's not leaving. And between me and you, I had a sword on me. Like, I'm talking about if I would if I would have stabbed somebody, I might have hit the person next to him, too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like a lawnmower blade. Pretty much. It was a it was a, a bar that was like welded onto the side of the desks. Right. Yeah. So it was probably about about two, two and a half feet. You know what I'm saying? Sharper <laughs> down to a point. Yeah. Yes. Took a minute to make that. But anyway, so I go in there and I was like, uh, hey, dig this here. He was like, what? I was like, you're getting ready to get a tattoo. And he was like, a tattoo? I was like, yeah. He's like, of what? I said, Katie's name. He's like, where at? I was like, on your forehead. 
And he said, how about my arm? And when he did it, <laughs> and that set me off. I don't know why. Just that response set me off. And I really messed up between me and you because, man, the, the knife's in my left hand, right? I hit him with my right. And when I do, he goes down. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, he, he's still standing, but he bends down. When he does, I drop it, grab the back of his head, and start uppercutting him. Now, if he'd have had the wherewithal of what's really going on, like, it's within reaching distance of him. Yeah. Uh, man, I hit him a couple more times and ended up slamming his head on the bunk. And then uh, he was like, okay, okay, okay. So I, he sits down. I was like, all right, sit down. Don't move. He sits down. I have the stuff on me. Like, in prison, obviously, we make our own tattoo stuff. I think it was a cassette deck motor, you know what I'm saying, ink pen. I had a battery pack. So everything, you know, fit within my pant pocket. Yep, yep. Yeah, I pull it out, and I push him back on the bed. Well, the needle I used, <clears throat> it was a uh, – it obviously wasn't sharp. Matter of fact, it was bird. You know what I'm saying? I knew it was going to hurt. It wasn't going to look good. So this is also a real interesting thing. So as soon as I push him back, I'm just getting ready to start, right? And uh, the door opens. It's wood, right? So – he looks up and sees wood. Now, keep in mind, this is a guy he's been paying to keep people off of it. So he's got this look like, oh, my God, like this, I'm, I'm cool. You know what I'm saying? I'm saved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like <laughs> there's just relief. He's like, okay, maybe this ain't going to happen. So uh, he's like, are you, Wood's like, hey, man, are you okay? And dude's like, no, 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 I'm not. No, and he's like, shut up. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to Chick. And at that point, I look back at him just like all color. You know what I'm saying? At that moment, he's like, all right, yeah, I'm I'm effed. I'm fucked. You know what I'm saying? This ain't going to go my way. So I was like, bro, I'm good. Just watch the door. He was like, I got you. And Wood pulls the door shut, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, like, I still didn't have a plan in mind when I was, I knew I was going to put Katie's name. So I ended up putting Katie's name on there. And that's why, if you notice, like, the Katie is actually kind of centered, right? Mm -hmm. But then, as like, as soon as I got that done, I was like, man, like, a majority of my friends have tattoos all over their face. You know what I'm saying? A lot of guys in there might even have their whole face done. And I wanted people to know it was done forcefully. It wasn't by choice. So that's why, like, you see the apostrophe S and then the revenge is just kind of shoved in at the bottom because that was like an afterthought. Yeah, but you didn't want him to be able to, like, show up somewhere and be like, oh, no, that's my old lady. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's beautifully executed, man. And I know that, like, so in my short video, I, I, I might have uh, said that the quality of the tattoo wasn't good. That's that I misspoke on that, bro. Like, I... <laughs> I do apologize. Uh, forcefully tattooing somebody, uh, you know, even if it's by duress and they're kind of submitting all of that, bro, that was beautifully executed work. And granted, it was just a cassette deck motor. But like as I was doing it, I was trying to go. I mean, I'm going to go so deep anyway because the layers of skin and it being a forehead. But the yeah. motor kept bogging down on me. It was like, mm, 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 and I'd have to pull out just enough to keep it spinning and still be able to tattoo. Yeah, for real. For real. Yeah, we used, uh, we had we had CD player motors. So like the CD okay. players, they came with like the pancake and the Jolly Rancher. So yep. I, in fact, I have one that I made just to show everybody how you make them uh, here with me. <laughs> like, yeah. I did it for a video, but um, so you, uh, you get them tattooed, which by the way, I want to applaud you on that again, because i honestly, I think that when somebody hurts a kid, like in any type of fashion, like predatory fashion, I think that they should be stamped somewhere like their forehead where they're identifiable for the rest of their life. I honestly think that's the bare minimum that we should be doing. A, a registry is great or whatever. They should have that too, so that we know where they live uh, and make sure that they're not near schools or playgrounds or shit like that. But yeah. I think that what you did, I think that should be standard for any predator. I, I mean, I personally think we should be launching them into wood chippers, but they're not going to go with me on that, bro. Like, yeah, I preach the wood chipper. Everybody's like, oh, he's kind of, yeah, it's too much. But um, so that was awesome. Then what happens? Do you end up getting hemmed up? Does he immediately go tell? Uh, he didn't, man. So what happened was, I guess he was on medication. Yeah. And so it was one of those medications he was required to take. And he didn't go to like the next three med passes. So at that point, the nursing staff's like, all right, why ain't this guy showing up? And they go to his cell to check on him. And when they do, he's got a bandage, like a homemade bandage on his head. And so they ask him to take it off. 
And when he does, then at that point, they're like, oh, shit. And then that's when they come in and then the whole investigation starts. So do they take you to the hole for the investigation? Oh, yeah. Like immediately. <laughs> immediately. <laughs> because after, the, like, as soon as the investigation started, like he didn't go, which I'm not just, he didn't go initially and tell on me. But as soon as they discovered it, he told everything and they instantly came and locked me up. Oof. Yeah. So he wasn't trying to be a snitch, but he was damn willing to be a snitch the second he got put. Exactly. As soon as the opportunity presented itself, he's like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. So did they wrap you up with uh, a disciplinary report and new charges too? Yeah, because um, in Indiana, they can do both. If you do something that warrants an uh, outside charge, then they don't consider it double jeopardy. You get hit on the institutional level and you yep. get hit you know, on outside. Yeah. Yeah. Same with Oregon. So what was the actual charge that they hit you with? Uh, originally, it was a C felony battery with bodily injury. Okay. Yeah. And then what was the, the disciplinary write-up? They gave me, so they wrote it up wrong and couldn't actually give me the assault charge. Okay. Right? They were so mad about that. But they actually gave me a tattooing charge and then maxed me out and gave me everything they could on it. Yes. So they, uh, I think the, the original sanction from it was they gave me a year disciplinary in the segregation in the hole, six months uh, phone restriction, six months commissary restriction, uh, and I believe that was it initially. I but, mean, that's that's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, but see, Indiana has what's called uh, administrative seg. And this is where they get you. So you might do something where they have a limited amount of time they can give you. Like they maxed me out and gave me the year seg time. Mm -hmm. But when your seg time's up, they can put you on what's called administrative seg, where basically all they have to do is sign some paper and say your safety and security to the prison or to the Indiana prison system, and they can hold you in seg indefinitely. Did they do that to you? Uh, I ended up doing just short. Uh, I did three years and three months in the hole without any conduct, without doing anything. And then they, because at one time, they brought me a piece of paper that said, I will never see population in the Indiana Department of Corrections again. Damn. And at that point, I had like 12 years left. <laughs> and bro, like right before this, you were looking at going to a lower custody prison. Yeah. So you, you knocked up and you handled business and you, instead of going to a lower custody prison, you could have shot yourself into 12 years in the hole. Yeah, exactly. The hole's no joke, bro. I, uh, yeah, you ain't lying. I'm not, I, I hate going to the hole, bro. Like, in, in the hole there, are you allowed to get commissary and stuff like that? Or I know you got nah, a six months, uh, six yeah, months no commissary, but. I know that that was actually a weird, you know what I'm saying, restriction they put on me because you don't even have access to commissary. That's kind of what I was wondering about. Yeah, I think they just wanted to max me out on everything possible. So you spent three and a half years in the hole for this? Yeah, from September of 06 to November of 09. Okay, what about the legal ramifications? All right, so like I said, I was originally charged with a C felony, which in Indiana at the time carried two to eight years. Mm -hmm. All right, so we talked about this a minute ago, but uh, I'm in my cell, you know, in segregation, like, you, like segregation in the higher security levels, you reach your hand out the cup port, they cup yep. your hand. Then the door will roll, you stand there, they put the leg shackles on, and then there's also a dog leash that runs from your handcuffs through your legs, where if you're walking, you know what I'm saying, they can just pull it and drop you at any time. They take like, you, you to and from the showers in that too? Yep. That's how they yeah, did you, us. Yeah, you yeah. don't leave the room unless, you know what I'm saying, you're secured. So I'm sitting in my room one day, and uh, man, my door just opens. That that doesn't happen, you know. So like my door opens and I'm I'm confused. I peek my head out. I don't see anybody at first. I'm like, man, did they just accidentally hit a button? Did my sit? You know, next <laughs> is thing, this I, a trap? Exactly. Like it almost seemed like a setup. So after about five minutes, man, I, I just step out of my room and I'm just standing on the tier, and I see two guards walking to me, and I fully expected them to be like, hey, get back in your room, you know, but they're like, hey, come with us. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, just come with us. I'm like, I'm not shackled. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, my hands are free, bro. <laughs> and they're like, nah, Harris, come on. It's cool. So I was like, all right. So they take me down a couple hallways, and I walk into a room, and there's a guy in a suit. He's got his hand out to me. And I'm like, uh, who are you? And he was like, I'm the prosecutor. I'm like, man, I'm not shaking your hand. <laughs> you know, like, not a chance in hell. 
And he was like, no, Mr. Harris, you don't understand. He was like, your C felony is now an A misdemeanor. So they dropped it from something that carried eight years to something that carried a max of a year to six. Yep. And he was like, he was like, look, he was like, man, that's the lowest thing I can drop it to. He's like, I can't just get it thrown out because formal charges were filed. He's like, but I just want to let you know, I got two daughters. I think what you did is amazing. You know what I'm saying? He was like, he had that coming and more. He was like, I'm sorry, I can't do better than this, but just know that you, it's the lowest charge I can possibly give you. He's like, if you want to sign a deal, I'll give you probation. Yeah, I was like, I was like, man, no disrespect. I appreciate what you at that point. I did shake his hand. I will say that though, man. You know what I'm saying? He not shook up after that. I would have too, bro. <laughs> yeah. Cause I respected that, man. That was real. And so I was like, man, I was like, I appreciate the deal. You know what I'm saying? But I just don't see me pleading guilty to this, regardless of what the punishment might be. I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to trial. And he was like, All right, man. Well, I'll tell you what. He was like, Look. I'm not going to bring up your prison history. I'm not going to bring up your criminal history. He's like, I'm not going to make you look bad. I'm not going to portray you in a negative light. I won't say one negative thing about you at this trial. He's like, I'll go in. I'll state the facts of the case. And this is one I hope I lose. So what happened was, when you went to trial? All right. So I ended up not going to trial. Man, this is how it happened. So it was a, uh, he also told me, he was like, man, if anything, anything happens throughout this court process where I can get this thrown out, He's like, man, you ain't got to worry about these charges a bit. What a I cool was like, prosecutor, bro. Yeah, man. So I was like, cool, thank you, man. So it was a year and 10 months after the fact. I'm still going back and you know, support the court for it. Well, after this happened, they took Stockelman and they, had, uh, they transferred him to one of the other maximum security prisons. All right. Well, when he got there, some friends of mine pulled up on him and they're like, hey, you testify on check, we're killing you. Plan <laughs> yeah. Down. Hell yeah. And so he wrote the prosecutor and he was like, look, I know I already gave this tape deposition, but that's just going to have to suffice. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to I'm not going to pop up in court. I'm not going to be testifying like I gave my statement. That's what it's going to be. Well, then the prosecutor was like, all right, well, if you're not going to testify in open court, we're dropping the charges. And so ultimately, I got the, the, the outside case against me dropped. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect, man. That's beautiful. So do you think that doing that? set you back from your release date at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, about definitely. How much time do you feel like you lost from it? Uh, roughly give or take two years, two years. Yeah. Do you regret it? No, not, not in the least bit. I was expecting that. I was expecting yeah. that my man. Uh, I've heard rumors and I don't know if you can dispel these rumors or, or confirm them that somebody like a nonprofit had it removed from his head. All right. So, yeah, that's what happened. I, I don't think it's so much. Honestly, I think why they did it was probably free publicity, because at this point it became a big case. Yeah. Like you said what happened was, OK, during the process of the investigation, instead of the because like, it happened like. All right. The investigators normally they're like Monday through Friday, you know, what I'm saying during the day, if anything, any incident happens at a different time, like the COs kind of handle it. And then when the investigators come in then they'll take over the case and go through and actually do everything well since it was night meds when the nurse discovered him like it was an officer that was able to like take the photos and write up the initial report it was two officers i don't remember their name unfortunately it's been a minute but that's how the whole story got leaked out one of the officers when taking the picture evidence photos sent them to her phone and then when she was out in the world, she loaded them on a, a website called Lost in Lima, Ohio, about sex offenders. Mm -hmm. And then it, from there, it went and made local news and then got picked up by Associated Press and then made big news. I kind of got off track a little bit. What was the original question? <laughs> so I was I was trying to figure out. So, oh, he got it removed from his head for free. Yeah. So I like I said, initially, I think what it was is just because of the, you know what I'm saying, this, the magnitude of the overall story, how it made news all over the country at this point, man, that someplace was just looking for an opportunity to get, you know what I'm saying, some free publicity out of it. Yeah. And so, yeah, a private company did offer to laser it off. But that being said, remember the deposition I told you that he initially took, but but wouldn't testify at trial? Yeah. It was it was a year into it. He had already went through all the laser treatments and my attorney was interviewing him, you know what I'm saying? Asking him questions or, and uh, they made him take the bandage off. He made him remove the bandage and all the ink was gone. Like you couldn't, you know what I'm saying? There was no black left, but you could still read the scar. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, at least that's still there, bro. Yeah. 
so, so the laser treatment only went so far. Yeah. Um, so what did uh what did the family think about what you did? Man, <laughs> at first, like I really didn't know how it was gonna go over. Because man, my mama, bless her, like she came and saw me every two weeks, which is what was allowed, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember right after it happened, they ended up locking me up. And uh <clears throat> it was a couple of days later, I was scheduled to have a visit with her. So I remember shooting a letter out real quick and being and this is what the letter said. It was like, hey, mom, they got me in SEG. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's no big deal. It'll blow over. I really didn't do nothing. Like, so let's not have this visit through glass. I'm sure, you know what I'm saying? The next one will be cool. We can go back to visitation room business. Well, in between me mailing that letter was when the initial story broke about him getting his forehead tattooed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my bro. mom saw the news story, got the letter like the next day and was like, yeah, that was Jared. That was <laughs> poor mom, bro. I put my mom through so much stuff when I was in prison, bro, in and out of the hole and everything. She'd show up for visits and they'd be like, Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> He's yeah. not available. The next visit I did have with her, man, like I ain't gonna lie, like my heart's racing. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm happy to see my mom, but at the same time, I'm like, Man, I'm getting ready to catch hell, right? Yeah, so she's sitting there and I come in because it's still behind glass because I'm still in sick and uh. I just look up at her, man, and uh, my mom couldn't help but smile. You know what I'm saying? Because at, at that point, like, yeah, it's still, you know what I'm saying, there's still sour feelings, and you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, it had, it, it had been a year, year and a half since the case, man. And so, like, yeah, she just looked at me and smiled, and she's like, damn. It was her idea, like, to be yeah. fair. Like, yeah. it was her idea. Yeah. And then so, when I pointed that, and then when I pointed that out, I, like of course, like my mom and I, we have a great relationship. You know what I'm saying? She's got a great sense of humor or whatever. And so like we were joking, and she was like, "Jared," and I was like, "What do you mean? Hold on, this came from you." <laughs> yes. Oh, that's lit, bro. I love that. Yeah. I love that so much. So, um, how did the rest of the family feel about it? Man. Uh, understandably there's some members that you know what i'm saying just want to try to forget it not necessarily katie but just the incident as a whole yeah know? for sure but, yeah and it was one of those things that like my mom was really the only one i was close to in prison you know what i'm saying because the mm-hmm. distance and everything else so i did happen in september of 06 i ended up not even getting out till august of 2012 so i didn't even get out till six years later yeah yeah, and so when I got out, though, you know what I'm saying, like, the, the family was reset. I Actually, I'll be honest with you, like, aside from my mom and a couple uh, aunts coming up, like, my first family gathering, you know what I'm saying, and, like, hugging me and thanking me quietly, I haven't spoken to any, like, it's never even been a topic of conversation in the family. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you've been out since 12, right? Yeah. What have you been doing since then? Uh, Tattooing. Hell Go yeah, figure, you're right. That's yeah. what's up, man. Uh, so I got I got the opportunity to go through your TikTok and look through some of the pieces you've done. Yeah. Like your work is sick. Thank you. Your man. work is really good. Um, and so like I had to apologize for uh for underestimating your work off of the Katie's Revenge tattoo, which is still glorious. I mean, that's yeah. epic. Um, but you were doing really good work. Are you doing work out of a shop? Men, yeah, so I've worked at a couple different shops, you know, mm-hmm. but I would say the town that the, the incident happened in was Crothersville, Indiana. I had never been to Crothersville, Indiana in my life. But uh, what's weird is, so, not weird, but I mean, it's kind of cool. Matter of fact, the shop I work at now is in that little town. Nice. Yeah. So um, do you do you want to plug your shop? Like, I can also put it, uh, all the information on being able to book with you if, if you want to put that out there. Uh, and your social medias, if you want to promote your work, um, down in the description. But do you want to shout it out? Yeah, I, I work at a Beauty for Mashes Tattoo LLC in Crothersville, Indiana. Man, there's myself. There's another artist named Kyle McIntosh and Lily Jones, both of who are amazing as well. You know, it's it's a smaller shop, but I mean, it's a wonderful one. And I mean, you, you're not going to get better work anywhere else. Nice, man. Nice. Well, if I can get to Indiana, man, I would really like to get a tattoo done from you. Oh, we can make it happen. Hell yeah, bro. Hell, I'm running out of space, dog, is the only thing. I, pr- I I promised my mama. So we talked about, we you know, we've put our mamas through some stuff. Yeah. I promised my mama I wouldn't tattoo my face. Uh, and I broke so many promises to her when I was using. Um, I'm running out of space, dog. 
it's it's a problem yeah right i feel it i spent uh i spent two years on house arrest having a an artist just come over he had just gotten out of florida prisons just blazing me up like i was getting tattoos two three times a week so uh you know on top of the stuff i already i i had all my penitentiary work gone back over a couple times and everything to darken it up so but uh i really hope that we could get together and i can get a tap from you soon bro without a doubt man just let me know hell yeah brother thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with everybody and to clear some things up man it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you bro because i've been a huge fan of what you did for a really long time thank you for your time today well, well, let me say this real quick. The reason why I did, JD, is because, man, like, someone hit me to, you know what I'm saying, you're doing the story on it, right? And mm-hmm. I've seen and probably heard a bunch, man, but you were actually the only person that's ever got it correct. And so I wanted to talk with you just to figure out, you know what I'm saying, the background, the details, and we did, you know what I'm saying? Like, you actually invested time in it and did research, and so I, I appreciate that, man. Well, man, the like, Katie deserved... Uh, all of my respect and my research and my time on it, what you did, your sacrifice in that situation. Like I I felt a certain weight to it because there was a lot involved. You know what I'm saying? And I really wanted to try to portray it as accurately as humanly possible. Unfortunately, sometimes we only have what the media has put out or what the police have put in reports. And we know that those are both kind of faulty sometimes. So I really try to decipher what the truth of, of, you know, the facts is when I go into a story like that, um, so that I, I, you know, just am respectful to all involved. Hey, it's me again. Yeah. So when I was going well, over this you, while man. I was editing, there were a few things that stuck out to me that I really wanted to talk to you guys about. First off, we forgot to mention that the two COs who took the pictures of dude's forehead with the Katie's Revenge tattoo, they both got fired. And I want to let you guys know exactly why that is. And it's also the same reason that we don't hear when bad stuff happens to chomos in prison all the time. Because it makes the prison administration look incompetent when they talk about things that are happening on the inside where there's violent attacks. That's why you really don't hear about all of these people that are on these bad charges with these high profile cases, getting beat up, getting stabbed, whatever the case may be, unless they have to go to an outside hospital or an outside facility. And then it happens only because the press gets the alerted thing to that it I want to talk beyond about what the prison can contain. I find it, that any organization would come and do that work for free of removing that tattoo, but also how disgusting it is that the prison would allow them to do that. There is never in any of the history of prisons that I have heard where prisons will let you get a cosmetic procedure done. They're not going to let people come into the prison to do a cosmetic procedure, and they're most certainly not going to let you out of the prison to be able to get a cosmetic procedure done. And This happened because this was a chomo, and it was a high-profile case that made them look bad, so this was a way for them to try to sweep it under the rug. That Deserve that tattoo. But it's just that another symptom on of his how sick and disgusting our society truly is. Like the only class of inmate that is protected due to the nature of their crimes are the ones who are down on sexually based crimes, and they can actually give you a hate crime for attacking these people if they can prove that it was based on their crime. But yo, I want to thank y'all for riding out with me once again, man. If you made it to the end of this video, I love you, dog. If you made it to the end of this video and you're not subscribed, go ahead and hit that button for me. Like the video, comment, share, anything you can to get this busted up. Because to be honest with you, man, I think this is a banger. I was really happy to be able to get this interview with Jared and to be able to share it with each and every one of you. One love, y'all. Catch you on the next one. Be good or be good at it, baby. Just